Thank you, and good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. Uh, a couple of things. I'm hoping the overhead projector will light up so you can see. We kind of revised that water bill insert for the elections. Um, I think I emailed that out to leadership today, but to take a look at it and see if you like it. Hopefully, the projector will run soon. And then to also let you know, we're kind of beginning to work on those candidate forums here at the Carnegie. You know, it's a tradition that we host those here with uh, the League, League of Women Voters. Uh, usually the Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce also works with us. The League of Women Voters moderates the, uh, the evening, and um, we help provide the facility and help staff the phone so that folks can call in from home if they have questions of the candidates. Those dates tentatively right now are March 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. I'll work on more of that and get you up to date as those things firm up with, uh, with our end. Um, but we hope Channel 16 uh, via Carla Parson ha Paulson has confirmed that that will be playing on Channel 16 and be rebroadcast on Channel 16. And then in addition, we will, uh, we will be um, web streaming those as well. And my apologies, I don't think the projector is working, so I'll just hand it out to those of you who have copies for it and uh, any other questions. Was that your only topic, Deborah? Okay. Move on. Is there anyone here from uh, Mayor Munson's office to speak today? Seeing none. Uh, audit committee, no report. Fiscal committee? Uh, we met last week for a little while. Uh, we had an update from uh, the uh, staff about record retention, and it appears that we're on schedule to make that decision uh, as far as the software issue goes. Uh, it, it, all 13 departments have been involved, which is good. And uh, I think Kenny Anderson is uh, representing the council in those discussions. So any other comments, Kenny? Or? No, at this time we've uh, taken presentations from several companies, and uh, that process still continues, and also uh, getting the needs of each department all put together also. And at that point, I'm sure the committee will come up with a good decision. There's been some real good presentations out there. Okay. Any other questions for either Gerald or Kenny? See none, we'll move on to the Land Use Committee. No reports. Okay. Public Services Committee. We're meeting following this meeting, and we will be discussing vehicles for hire, a review of that, as we discussed last week, and then uh, <coughs> garbage and recycling ordinance discussion. Okay. Any uh, questions for Councilor Brown? If not, we've got City Council open discussion. Is there any items for open discussion? Councilor Jameson. I saw Mark Cotter in the house. But I, I just wanted to ask if uh, maybe some of the other councilors have driven around Minnesota Avenue and 12th and 10th Street and just noticed the abundance of potholes and cracks in the road and all the, as rough as the roads are. And <clears throat> I know the state's giving those back to us in some fashion or some way, but I just got to say, somehow or another, we can't go another year like this. I don't know how we can prevent it, but uh, I was asking maybe if Mark could update us on what timeline there is for the turn back, but... I mean, if we got to overlay these streets for some, you know, if it's already ours, Pat's telling me, we got to, this has just got to change. I just can't. Is anybody else experiencing the same frustration? Let's hear from Director Cotter. Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> We've been talking potholes, I think, for, um, since we got, the amount of rain that we got in January has really made this, from our standpoint, a very unusual um, spring or trying to get to spring you know normally we don't see normally we don't see this amount of rain which really precipitated all the all, you know the all the pothole material to come out and then essentially what we're going to see is that just with freeze thaw uh, activities from now till the end of April you know we will once just like after this event with snow once we get done with that, we transition right back into street maintenance. Um, very unusual for us to be out this time of year to this level, having to actually do this amount of repair. And, and we certainly attribute it to all the rain, and all that rain gets precipitated down into those 
areas, and then once it goes into a freeze-thaw cycle, lifts it, and then um, we're out there. So, But specifically on the turnback agreement, that's an agreement that the City of Sioux Falls signed in 2005, and it's a large agreement that deals with um, a lot of state system roads through and around our city. And I can certainly address any or try to address any direct questions on that turn back agreement if you have them. Mr. Cutter. Well, Mr. Chair. Council Jameson. I well, <coughs> first off, Mark, <coughs> you got to know how much we appreciate the work you're trying to do. You're fighting Mother Nature that's, she's just not going to give up on us, mm -hmm. it seems like. But keep up the good work. My curiosity is do we own those streets already, just in general? We do. Um, and, you know, just in broad brush, the DOT made the commitment to reconstruct 12th Street, really from Marion Road all the way through the city to Big Sur River. And that work's done. Um, they also made the commitment to reconstruct South Minnesota Avenue from 69th Street down to 85th Street, and that's done. And so portions of the agreement are done. Um, there was a... There was a a schedule that I don't believe will be met on South Dakota 100, just with that we've all hear about the state's funding. Um, but they have started South Dakota 100, and they, the, there's going to be another mile. The city's portion of South Dakota 100 will be bid in about two months. That's from 12th Street up to Madison. So there'll be another mile built this year. The next mile and a half of South Dakota 100 will come in 2012. So it's progressive, but I think we... Um, we'd like it to be at a higher rate, obviously, just with the expanding traffic needs that we've got. They also identified $25 million that we could invest into Russell Street, West, mm. North Cliff Avenue, and 60th Street North. And we've started design um, on West, and this was just actually ironed out last year. We're going to start design on all those streets. And then we're essentially going to um, develop good phasing structures, but we expect West would be first. Um, and so, and a part of that turn back agreement was also that the city of Sioux Falls, at the time we signed the agreement, Minnesota Avenue is in relatively good shape. I mean, the from 57th Street up to about 18th Street was reconstructed. And as you drive that today, that's actually in pretty good shape. I mean, it's in horrific shape from 18th up to 8th. And then as we go north of there, um, it's really uh, it's really gone downhill in the last five years. And so, but the 115 that was a part of the turn back um, was all of Minnesota Avenue up to Benson Road and then north out of town on Cliff Avenue. So it's, it's a large document. There's a lot of commitments in that agreement that collectively with the DOT we've we and they acknowledge that they're not going to be able to meet their uh, time frames that were identified in there just based on their current funding issues. But we also recognize that we've got Minnesota Avenue that with the amount of rain and just the amount of traffic that we have on Minnesota Avenue that we've got to do something. And so that's on our that's in our plan. What we've identified to do is actually design that road. Um, we're going to design from 18th up to 8th, and then we are bidding an enormous amount of work between now and the end of March. And based on how those competitive bids come in, we're going to find we're going to look for a way to fit it in if we can actually have competitive bidding that can actually through even after our budget reductions, we're hopeful that we can actually get that section of Minnesota done. Um, Tenth and Cliff, if that's your commute every day, that's obviously very rough. Um, I think it's been shared in the paper that every time we go out to patch that intersection, we'll put anywhere from six to eight tons of material. Um, we are expecting to rebuild that in 2011 if we can procure all the necessary right away. But in the short term time frame, we are going to uh, do a good patch on that intersection, then we're going to overlay it this summer. So that will, if, if right away, negotiations get delayed, that um, overlay will take us at least into another year. And then there's also a, there's also uh, an area on 41st Street that we're also going to design from I-29 out to Marion Road. And if, again, if, if our program allows, um, we'll add that. We also already have a very extensive pavement management program, as you know, with 
uh, neighborhood reconstructions, um, microsurfacing, mill and overlay, and again, um, we've we've had the benefit of some very good competitive bids, and if those continue, um, that's how those pooled projects work. You just continue to put plans on the shelf, bid them by priority, and get as much done in one season as we can. Mark, just on the Minnesota, um, if you were able to have enough savings from the other projects, and would uh, 18th to 8th Street, would that be just joint repair, or would that be a complete reconstruction? or would It'll be a little bit of each. Um, if you drive that, the southbound lanes are in worse shape than the northbound lanes. And so in some respects, the southbound lanes would, in some areas, be total repaves. And then would you do the underground as well? Um, that's the, We talked about that today, and uh, at least today we don't have a, any key identified underground projects there. So that is essentially one of the limiting factors of North Minnesota. Is that's one of our main feeder lines that comes out of the water plant. And we're going to, I mean, to actually do more with North Minnesota, we've got some utility, significant utility coordination to do. Councilor Staggers? Yes. Um, Mark, thank you for telling us about, uh, you know, what's going to be happening in the future, in the rather distant future. But I guess my concern is right now what's going on. I'll have to admit, a few days ago I was at 10th and Cliff, and, I mean, I was shocked uh, you know, by the situation there. I mean, I've driven in other countries of the world, in developing countries, going around holes and everything like this, and I, I could not believe it. Now, I understand there's all kinds of problems, you know, with us keeping up with that, but it seems to me that when we talk about major intersections and major streets, we have to make sure that we take care of those on a daily, hourly basis, whatever it is, because that's where so much traffic is. Mm -hmm. And once again, I, I, I know another council member had concern about 10th and Cliff, too. And, and then I go and drive there or try to maneuver around all those holes. I mean, we just simply have to be out there if it has to be on a daily or hourly basis to make sure we take care of that. Now, once again, I'm glad that you know, we're, we're planning for the future and so mm -hmm. forth, but immediately this was, it was a disaster. And so, I don't know, I just, what I'm trying to say is, can in the next, you know, few days we just really focus on the heavily traveled streets where we're having all these terrible things happening, and, and if the, the, the material comes back up, we get back out there and do it again. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what we are doing, just focusing on the arterials and collectors. But, um, and then as soon as we, we're wrapping up at this snow event, because we do have, we will go into zone two tonight, as you've seen the press release, and, and by the time we come out of that activity, then the same people that are in those sanders are also on our uh, pothole crew. So then we'll transition back to going 24-7 with that crew as well. Because it's good to have the snow off the streets, but also it's good to have this main arterial streets drivable. Right. I mean, we're having people coming from outside of Sioux Falls and encountering this. I don't, I don't know what they're thinking. And this is just, it's, it's not good. I know, and I, I mean, I can certainly tell you I commute every day as well. And normally this time of year we'll have a lot, you know, we'll have the temperatures that we're having today. Mm -hmm. And those areas, first of all, we don't lose all of our material like we did in January when we got an inch of rain. I mean, that really um, made us somewhat swim against the current just with you know just with that amount of material coming out at once at that time of year these are you know from our standpoint this isn't good um, time of year to actually prep yeah, the pad sure. you know we always blow them out tack them and then good put good material in and so unless you're able to do that and if weather requirements are conducive to doing that it is a temporary fix sure. I think Probably one of the best things we've got is we did uh, purchase a, a, a hot plant two years ago, which creates uh, 10 tons of material per hour, and that's been really that's been a, a godsend in this time. So we can at least the material is actually staying longer than it would if it was cold material. So, yeah, so so do we have some kind of um, I don't know assurance that, for example, Tenth and Cliff and the main streets are going to be serviceable uh, I, mean, I, I can tell you counselor it's going to be a difficult spring I mean we are we're going to put every effort we got out there but until there is weather is conducive to us doing a very good job um, and then this summer again we'll prep it very well we'll patch it just like we did on Louise last year and then we'll have it overlaid so 
Um, we won't have that situation at 10th and Cliff until we actually go in to reconstruct. And so the one thing I've been communicating is just obviously it's it's important to drive safe, have patience, and um, we don't again, even have any warning signs up for some of these areas. I mean, maybe we should be doing that too. We can certainly consider that. Because, I mean, people that might be from out of town hitting those holes, I mean, it's, it's you know, lots of damage to vehicles. Right. Well, again, too, some other key areas that people use every day, River Boulevard, that will be reconstructed this year. Um, we're going to do a significant uh, improvement to Burnside, which we've got a lot of faulting joints out there. So we have, we have a, an extensive program. We have a lot of concrete rehabilitation that we're planning to do this year. Um, that will definitely make an impact on the system. And so, again, it's been a very unusual winter for snow accumulation, but also that amount of rain in January. It's, um, we are trying to work as quickly as we can to make the roads drivable. Mark, I'm just curious. On, when we do a patch now, how long does it last? I mean, is it a, does it last a week typically? Or, and I would just mention, I, I drove through that intersection, 10th and Cliff, on Saturday morning, and, and it looked like it had been recently patched. I know you're doing that overnight. And, it almost, I mean, it looks like a checkerboard, but um, it, it was tough and obviously it needs to be reconstructed. But how long will that last? Now, will this last snow, or if it rains again, will that have to go back and do it all over again? Or uh, We will have to go back and do it. I mean, that intersection likely will be there every week um, throughout the spring. And it largely depends, too, on just the amount of truck traffic. You know, just the pneumatic action of a truck can pull a lot more material out than urinite vehicles. And so... If it's a collector road that does not see very much for truck traffic, those will stay much longer than what an area like 10th and Cliff will. I believe just a snowplow going over it on Monday and or Sunday and Monday probably pulls it out too. Well, at least cleans it off. So, <laughs> any other questions for Mark? I've got a couple more. Okay. I'm just curious, Mark. Um, we, today we were doing snow pickup along Minnesota Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, do we do that at night as well? We do. We'll run 24 hours a day until we're done. Then why don't we do Minnesota and 41st Street at night? Because it had traffic backed up again. I know we've talked about this in the past, and I, I just I don't understand why we pick the afternoons during the week to do it on Minnesota and 41st Street. Well, 41st Street's absolutely at night. Okay. Um, Minnesota Avenue and I was out just after lunch. We were north of A Street, and there are areas that's more conducive to doing it during the day. Um, you know, one benefit of this snow, there's not much snow in the wind row, and so people can actually cross this one. But we are definitely conscious, definitely of 41st Street, that there's so much commercial traffic. There's so many driveway approaches. People need, you know, it's tough for people to actually be out there, and it's a safety issue um, for both sides. And so 41st Street is a 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. approach. I, I would encourage you to consider making Minnesota that way as well. But okay. Very good. Any other Questions? Okay, we'll move on. Any other City Council open discussion? If not, we've got two presentations today. Uh, the first one is uh, 2009, 2009 International Fire Code by Perry Bolden, Fire Marshal. Welcome, Perry. Good evening, Council. Perry Bolden, Fire Marshal, City of Sioux Falls. Uh, Ron and I are here tonight, uh, myself, obviously, on the International Fire Code, uh, just as an informational uh, session. You should have in front of you a document that is basically a synopsis of major changes uh, and considerations in the fire code. The, the attached ordinances, they propose to adopt the 2009 International Code. This code is promulgated by the International Code Council on a triannual basis. Every three years it's uh, uh, proposed changes are looked at, evaluated, uh, either thrown out or voted in. And the intent uh, for the fire code is to address fire prevention, fire protection, life safety, and safe storage and use of hazardous materials and new and existing buildings. Uh, it is a major companion document to the other I codes, those being the International Building Code, uh, Mechanical Code, and the others that are part of the series. Uh, in essence, it is with the exception of the fire protection requirements, it is a maintenance uh, code. In other words, the building code drives construction, new construction, uh, remodels. The fire code is 
once something is constructed, other than the fire protection aspects, uh, it's more of a maintenance code, kind of an after, after the, the fact uh, means of going out and providing rules and regulations for uh, maintenance of required installations. Notable changes, and I'll, I'll try to make this quick and brief and then open it up for any questions. Notable changes from the 2006, which we're currently under, to the 2009 uh, International Fire Code. Section 102.5, application of residential code. This is one that essentially uh, looks at things such as streets, hydrants, etc., that have always been uh, in the code as far as establishing minimums. Uh, but now it's more specific. And the context of that you would find in the actual <coughs> ordinance document. Uh, it governs things such as premise identification, addressing, uh, fire apparatus access, water supplies, etc. Section 103 or 106.3, concealed work. This is this particular item that's new in the fire code is something that essentially takes what's in reference standards. The International Fire Code quite often will refer to other standards. For example, NFPA 13 is, is fire sprinkler systems, NFPA 72 is fire alarm systems. And what it does is it has the concealed work provisions that are in those other standards and now puts them in one place. What does it do for us? We don't have to look so long and hard to find them in those individual standards and now in the code. Section 112.1, that uh, provides the authority to disconnect service utilities. Uh, this would be, for example, at an emergency scene. This has been in code but in a different format. Uh, it's actually been an ordinance for a number of years but now it's actually in the body, body of the code. So for example, if we needed to have power disconnected, gas shut off, etc., you know, this provides the authority to do that. Section 316 uh, moves some of the other requirements around that were formerly in Chapter 5. The new portion with this, it does add requirements for construction of structures and storage of combustibles uh, beneath high power uh, distribution uh, transmission lines. Section 404.3.3, lockdown plans. <clears throat> We're seeing more and more facilities, primarily your school system and such, that does have, uh, do have provisions and do have plans for lockdown procedures, uh, if you will, post Columbine type situation if they need to secure the school. The code now provides some guidance because you have to look at the life safety of if something happens in the building that you need to get people out, how do you apply it then when you're under a lockdown situation? So it provides guidance for planning for those contingencies. Uh, Section 510, this is a big one, and I'll say it a big one. It, it's new, obviously, and... Uh, what this essentially does is it provides us with the ability to go to those facilities that, that due to the size of the facility, the construction of the facility, uh, do not have adequate radio coverage. In other words, our radios, not just ours, police, fire, et cetera, do not have the capability to transmit out of the building or within the building amongst the other responding crews. This is, this basically is a post-911 uh, feature that came into the codes just based on the lack of, number one, interoperability of the radio system, and number two, being able to use your radio when you're in the building. The cost for adding the equipment to ensure the coverage within a given facility would be borne by the facility. There are you know, and I, and I did, I, I checked the numbers on this to see what, what kind of numbers would be out there to equip a facility, and it's hard to put an, uh, a dollar amount on that. Basically, I was told anywhere from $8,000 up to, you know, $20,000, $30,000. It all depends upon the coverage that's in the facility and determining uh, the level of coverage that exists in order to get it to where it needs to be. Perry, would you mind if we asked you questions as long as no, we go fine. on? Okay. You bet. Councilor Jameson. Could, could you just give us an example, like, how big of a building are we talking about, size-wise, that we can compare in our own minds? Well, uh, the hospitals are 
real good example. Given the, the size of the building, uh, where a lot of the equipment is within the building, that would be a good example. I can think of a city building here that uh, would be affected by this, and that would be the pavilion. If we're in the, in the uh, essentially in the basement area, the, the lowest level of the pavilion, we cannot communicate outside of that basement level the way it is right now. Okay, like a regular apartment complex, though? Typically, we have no troubles in okay. apartment complexes. So major, right. substantial building. Substantial concrete and steel, basically. Councilor Staggers? Yes, uh, Perry, uh, so you, you gave the example of the pavilion. Mm -hmm. So if this would be uh, implemented, then the pavilion would have to uh, spend money to buy some transmitters or something, so it would be able to get the signal out of the basement to your... Basically, practical? that would be correct, oh, okay. Mr. Staggers. It would, uh, and again, it, it's going to be driven by the facility. That one, I don't think, you know, our biggest difficulties in that particular building are the basement, the lower levels. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not, Don, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that's probably the worst area within that building. We absolutely cannot receive signals in the basement, let alone get out. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's probably way more detailed, but I'm just curious. I mean, if, if the transmitter gets damaged in the fire that is occurring there, what's the sense of that? Or why not have stronger radios? Well, we are on the state digital radio system. Uh, I, you know, I, I guess the potential is always there to have the equipment damaged. You hope it's not in the vicinity where the fire starts, but I guess you know that could be the the, the uh, occurrence. But uh, to answer your question, well, I, I assume that we'll look into the whether or not having a half a dozen buildings uh, have to go through the expense if it would be cheaper to go another route and do, have better radios or something. I guess. Yeah, the technologies are different. I mean, this is an issue that has been throughout the country. And we're, I guess, under the limitations of our current radio system. And do we go to the facilities that, that we have to respond to as emergency responders and say, you need to provide for our safety within there, or do we go to the taxpayer and say, it's your responsibility to pay for the extra equipment to do it? That's a decision that, you know, we have to make. I, I suppose that's a slippery slope because you could say, well, how many buildings do we need the, the ladder truck for? You know, do we allocate that on to only uh, five-story buildings, or uh, does it, do the residents need to compensate for that one as well? Well, there are more factors that come into sure, play. Yeah, there. ISO yeah. being the, the major one there. Okay. So. okay. Uh, any other questions on that particular? Okay. Uh, section 609, Commercial Kitchen Hood Systems, this is something new in the code, and it is a welcome provision in the code from the standpoint it doesn't, it no longer looks at, because you have a commercial cooking system, which typically uh, requires a, a fire suppression system, uh, the cooking that is done in, say, for example, a Chinese uh, restaurant or uh, versus what you would have done in a church that may have the same setup is significantly different. One is operating constantly, continually, basically, high volume, and the codes have now provided provisions that lay it out and, and allow for less frequency of inspections, for example, in a church versus what you would have in a high volume cooking operation. Uh, it's a good provision, and I think it's an overdue provision in that it does allow us the latitude to say, okay, yep, you're not in that high volume cooking, therefore your inspection frequency is, is less. Councilor Staggers. Yeah, Perry, um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware uh, that um, there has been somebody, uh, at least they went to our church mm -hmm. and take, took a look at our uh, uh, cooking area and said, hey, we're going to have new codes coming into play here. You've got to buy this new system. And then in checking on that, uh, the person that said that was incorrect. And so are you aware of any of these manufacturers, these products going around saying, hey, this is going to be in the code now and you've got to get it uh, by such and such a date and, and it's erroneous? Well, here's what, uh, you know, if you look back at the history of that, uh, Prior to, I believe it was early 90s, I'll just say the early 90s, 
most of your kitchen hood extinguishing systems were of a dry chemical based uh, type system. And they looked at the cooking had changed. We'd gone over to more vegetable oils as far as the, the, the cooking versus animal fats, et cetera. And they had uh, more hazards in, involved in them. In other words, they were finding that your dry chemical wasn't working. Okay, that's part of this to get to, to the answer. When, when they came out with a new standard, UL 300 was a standard that provided for a wet chemical uh, in these systems. They gave a certain window to implement that. And what we did as a fire department was go to facilities such as churches that, that we knew did not, uh, you know, do the production of grease-laden vapors like, you know, a 24-7 uh, restaurant would. And we approached them and said, well, just write us a letter that says, that essentially states uh, the type of cooking you do, the frequency of it, acknowledge the fact that you don't do cooking that produces grease-laden vapors, and we will accept it. So we didn't force them into a UL 300 system. Well, what happens from there, you, you still have the existing equipment that's required to be serviced, but once it gets to a certain point, uh, for example, the cylinders, the pressurized cylinders, at a certain point, they're no longer uh, testable, if you will, and they have to be replaced, and I think that's probably what you were dealing with. Mm. Now, the difficulty there is if the mechanical code, the building code, states that you have to have a type 1 hood system, it requires a suppression system, and, and that's basically where it's at. Our understanding is, is that we don't have to do anything, our church. Uh, that may certainly be the case. So, But I, I guess I was a little concerned that maybe you know, a salesman is going around and maybe giving some erroneous information to different organizations to sell product. And well, I, I really don't think that uh, the information is erroneous as much as it is that, that I think what they're trying to convey is the equipment that you have mm -hmm. we can no longer service, therefore we have to hang a non-compliant tag on it. The inspectors may come out and say, now you're going to have to do something. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to be proactive in getting the sale, if you will, up front. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that? Uh, sprinkler protection group E occupancies, section 90323. What this did was lower the threshold it, uh, for sprinkler system within an educational occupancy uh, from 20,000 square feet to 12,000. Anything greater than 12,000 square feet would be required to be sprinkled. Is that, if I can ask, is that, is that retroactive then? I mean, so no, that would not oh, be okay. retroactive. Okay. Uh, chapter 46, construction requirements for existing buildings, essentially what they did in the, in the body of previous editions of the code in each specific chapter, they had existing building provisions. Now they moved existing building provisions into its own chapter. It makes it a lot cleaner, uh, not only for myself as a code official, just go back there and plug it in. I don't have to hunt around as much in the book. It makes it easier for anyone that would come down and look at the fire code to see what kind of provisions may be in place. So those are uh, notable changes in the 2006 or 2009 from the 2006. Now getting into the uh, local modifications, uh, essentially if you're looking at the, uh, the code or excuse me, the ordinance, uh, you'll see that we had gone in and basically overstruck everything and now putting it back in with our previous amendments and new amendments that, that are coming with the 2009. Uh, one of the items, section 901.7, we are looking to add that provision that should be in red or if you've got a grayscale printed document, uh, a little lighter in color there, to provide for those rare occasions. Uh, if I were to take a guess, maybe four or five times a year, Don? Where we are called out to a facility, it could be an apartment building, it could be a business, and we can't get a hold of anyone uh, to respond, to take over the scene essentially for us. What code does require, if we go to a building that has a required fire protection system, and that, and that fire protection system is uh, out of service for whatever reason, either the building is emptied, 
from a code standpoint, we could actually force the emptying of the building, which would be something that we desire not to do, uh, especially in the case of an apartment building, uh, or provide for fire watch. Now, on those occasions when we cannot, have not been able to contact someone to respond, say a manager, an owner, a responsible party, we are essentially stuck there at the scene until we do get a hold of some, someone to assume that responsibility. We cannot walk away from a disabled fire protection system. So what we're looking to do is in those, on those rare occurrences where we cannot get hold of the representative is to provide the fire watch through Sioux Falls Fire Rescue personnel uh, through a callback and essentially bill back to the property owner or the manager for the facility for the time. Uh, again, it's, it's a rare occasion, but currently and as in, in the past, and currently we, we do not have provisions in place to do this. This would provide it without the taxpayer having to spend to accomplish that. The big advantage is we're getting our, our personnel, our equipment back in service quicker. It's not tied up on a scene waiting around. So that is the intent of that provision. Okay, 902. This was a change in definitions. Ron and I worked on this. Uh, essentially, take something that is new into the code and strikes that, and that is where they're including things like canopies and such, additions to the building that would be figured in a fire area. And essentially, if you had a building and you, that's non-sprinkled, you added a canopy. If we left this provision untouched, if that canopy addition put you over the fire area allowance, you would be retrofitting your building for the sprinkler. This takes that out. Group M, uh, 903-2.7. This is an amendment. Uh, this was a change in this edition of the code that uh, Ron and I discussed it discuss this particular one at length and uh, came to an agreement on it. Essentially the way it was worded, if you sold uh, upholstered furniture in your store, you'd have to sprinkle, period. Okay. This is basically a reaction to the Charleston, South Carolina fire that uh, killed uh, nine firefighters. Is that last year? Uh, yeah, last year. Uh, what, what it did was uh, Essentially, like I say, you, you were sprinkled if you came in. Not it didn't. It wasn't retroactive. It didn't go back to existing buildings, but it would have applied to any shop. Say, for example, a secondhand furniture store that would have come into a say a downtown downtown build, uh, business or building and uh, sold a couch or two. They would have had to sprinkle. So what uh, Ron and I did is we worked on. We came to a consensus of 6,000 square feet as a threshold for doing that. And the use is primarily for the sale of upholstered furniture. The key issue here is that your upholstered furniture typically contain a large volume of your polyurethane foams, which in the fire service, we essentially look at it as a solid form of gasoline. It burns very well, a lot of BTU, uh, and the fires can get out of control in a short order. Yes, sir. What is Group M? Can you give us Mer a mercantile. Mercantile. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Group M would be mercantile. 903.2.8. Uh, automatic sprinkler system installed in accordance with another section. Uh, and essentially what this does is maintains a local amendment we've had in place for a number of years. And we did go to the land use committee with this and uh, looking to go with what the model codes have in there and the land use committee recommended do not pass for this particular one. So uh, we're s essentially sticking with what we had in the prior editions of code. 907.211, system initiation of group A occupancies. A group A is an assembly occupancy, covers everything from a large gymnasium, uh, an arena, uh, to a church. And what we did with this is provided an exception uh, 
a group A occupancy that exceeds an occupant load of 1,000 is required by code to have a voice evac system. In other words, instead of your normal, those of you that have been in a building that where the alarm has gone off and you have the typical uh, horn strobes with the pulsing uh, notification, voice evac is a voice. You have a short tone and then a, a voice that comes on and tells you to go to your nearest exit, etc. It is significant cost to go to a voice evac system. A number of the uh, majority of the churches here in town, the uh, uh, places of religious worship, are equipped with a fire alarm system. And a lot of them are undergoing expansions. The thing with a, a church, typically your people that are in that building are inherently familiar with the building. So we looked at that and just essentially de uh, decided that we would exempt places of religious worship from the requirement to have voice e back fire alarm system. And uh, that will essentially save them some cost. IFC Chapter 10, Means of Egress. As you look at this, there's really not much underneath here. I did not include all of the Chapter 10 changes. Uh, essentially what we've, what we've had for many years, there are provisions or chapters in the fire code and the building code that are with the exception of maybe one or two sections, they're identical. And Ron and I have worked hard for a number of years to make sure that those sections that are in the fire code and the building code, that when I make a change, he's got the same change and vice versa. Historically, building services has governed chapter 10. Now again, getting back to what I stated earlier, we are the maintenance side of it. So we come out two years later, and if we did not amend this, we may, and this has happened. We've had requirements in the fire code uh, that didn't line up with the changes that were made in the building code. We want consistency. Consistency not only for our own benefit, but obviously <coughs> for the benefit of those that we serve. So you don't have building services saying one thing and the fire side saying the other. That was the intent. Uh, Ron will have all of the Chapter 10 changes in his synopsis and in his ordinance. Well, we'll have them in the fire code ordinance also. But the last item I have here is Section 2206.2. And essentially, Sioux Falls has had an amendment on the books for many, many years that requires double-walled underground storage tanks to be used with an exception that provided for where you could not due to geographic, say for example, if you are on, you know, you, your uh, rock table is, is real close to the surface, you can't, can't do the digging there, or whatever the reason that you could not do an underground storage tank, uh, it would have to be documented that it couldn't be done, basically an engineering analysis, and then we would consider above ground storage tanks. Above ground storage tanks, are, from the fire code standpoint, not quite as safe as your underground, okay? With the exception that we have added here, and again, that's that item in, in red or in light gray on the uh, grayscale printed one. What we're looking to do is where that has not been, where that engineering analysis has found that underground storage is not feasible, we'll accept an above ground storage tank that storage tank would have to meet UL 2085 for construction requirements. What is UL 2085 is basically a reinforced tank that is uh, ballistic proof, fireproof, has all the bells and whistles for leak detection, uh, all the piping and everything is, is uh, it's a nice system. It is to go above ground with a tank like this, it would be less expensive for a facility just given the fact that you don't have to do the excavation and all the uh, site work for the underground tank. And we're still getting the benefit of having basically a, a very, very stout tank that's uh, not easily going to be penetrated or ruptured and provide any kind of environmental contamination. With that, that's all I have. Uh, any questions? Councilor Staggers? Yeah, Perry, uh, with all these new regulations, um, any estimates on the costs for for implementing these new regulations, the costs for private businesses and things like that? 
Well, there's been a lot of give and take over the years in the codes. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of uh, credit for sprinkler systems, for example, and uh, to actually put a number on that would be difficult for me, Mr. Stegger. Yeah. We do consider that when we're looking at this, but we also have to consider public safety and uh, those that respond, safety of the responders. Councilor Bennigan. Perry, I'm wondering, uh, when you do your annual certification, or it's not annual, it's a process that we go through every few years to, <coughs> excuse me, to be able to uh, receive the best uh, insurance rating for the commercial buildings that we have. Do they take a look at the uh, regulations that have been proposed and compare those to national standards to get that certification. I know the uh, ISO group that you refer to all the time talks about meeting specific minimum standards. Is this part of that minimum? This would be your uh, adopted codes are part of the minimum standards that are looked at amongst many other things, yes. So basically, by approving these, we're getting the best possible rate for insurance purposes in the community? In my opinion, yes. Okay. Perry, I'm just curious on the um, 907 or point two, point one, point one, the system group A, the occupancy, when you get over the 1,000. Yes. I mean, the voice alarm versus uh, the regular alarm that we've always heard, I mean, it's but people don't understand what's going on when the alarms go on. I mean, what, 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 how, is it proven to be more effective? or what? It has proven to be more effective in those uh, venues that people are not as inherently familiar with, you know, the, the typical human nature is to go, go out of a building the same way they go in, okay, where you have people that aren't familiar with that building that they're in. That's certainly going to apply, but the voice evac, they have found studies have shown that it's a little more Calming provides a little bit more direction. Now, conversely with that, we have found situations, and I'll go back to uh, Jim Daniels, uh, retired fire marshal, retired a number of years ago, was sitting in a, uh, a basically a basketball game at one of the schools in a packed gymnasium, and uh, it had voice evac, and you couldn't hear it at all. So we really have to look at the voice evac requirements. And in, in that case, we did modifications to code and allowed them to do regular horn strobes. Have you all had the, the pleasure of hearing your horn strobes in here go off? And, yeah. Uh, essentially designed to drive you right out of a building. Uh, they, they certainly work. But uh, we looked at, as I stated, a typical church typical place of, of worship. The majority of people in there are familiar with their surroundings and this, instead of forcing that extra cost, and that cost typically is anywhere from ten dollars to $15,000 for the voice evac package, if that does not, if it is compatible with the existing fire alarm system they have, if it's not, then it could be considerably more money because it's uh, wiring and everything that's involved. Does, does the voice part of it, does it say, you know, please exit the north? Or does it give direction or does it just say get out of the building? Or It says go to your nearest exit and evacuate. It does not per area state what that nearest exit would be. It's one recorded voice message okay. followed with a series of notification alerts, basically. Okay. Any other questions for Perry? Thank you. Thank you very much. The next presentation is the 2009 International Building Code, uh, Existing Building Code, Residential Code, Mechanical and Fuel Gas Code, Property Maintenance Code by Ron Bell, Chief Building Services Officer. Welcome, Ron. Good afternoon. Ron Bell, Planning Building Services. What's being proposed here is the adoption of all the I codes. We come to you um, every three years. Um, the codes are promulgated, like Perry said, through the International Code Council. And Building Services use, uses a series of these national model codes. Um, they came out probably last March. And since then, we've been working on meet, many meetings with architects, contractors, disability people, engineers, and, and the like to let people know what the changes are, to go to go through what the changes are, get their input, and if so, make 
local modifications to the code wherever we feel that's necessary with with the primary criteria of, of maintaining life safety and also um, affordability. Uh, Perry went through a lot of the things with the International Building Code, which we'll start out with. Um, what you'll have by ordinance is, for the Building Code, is Section 1117 adopted and 1120 is all of the changes. But what you will see with the ordinance is, is that with the changes, we simply overstruck everything and inserted everything back in, which doesn't give you really any idea of what the local modifications were. Um, instead, what we've done on our website is to actually put track changes into the code so you can see what is changed in the code as far as track changes. And that still probably won't give you a good idea of what the new things are, what the new changes are. So what we did is we put together an ordinance synopsis and submittal, which is really these significant changes for the building code whittled down to what we think is the most significant changes. And like I said, Perry went through a lot of these. Um, uh, one major change with the IBC is it's, it's taken, well, since uh, 9 -1 -1, that a lot of things got put in the code from, from the World Trade Center. The National Institute in Science and Technology um, produced studies um, of what happens in high-rise buildings, and a lot of those things got put into the building code. It's taken that long. Um, so, so many of these things are not going to be applicable here in Sioux Falls because we don't build that many high-rises, but there, there's a couple um, that will affect the few times that we do have buildings over 75 feet, and you'll see those as far see that as far as any change. Uh, there's a new provision called live work units. This is dealing with a place where a business occurs and an individual lives in the same type of business. Um, there's been um, in interpretive issues um, in the past as to where you require um, separation between your living area and your mercantile area or your or your office or whatever. Accessibility is another issue. This got put into the code um, to try to clarify what, what, what would happen in that type of an instance. Um, ambulatory health care facilities was a, another change um, because where you have same-day surgery, all that they were having to meet is provisions for an office occupancy. Nowhere's close to a hospital, so provisions got put in to get a same-day surgery to be to have certain requirements that more nearly resemble a hospital situation where you have people that are incapable of self-preservation. Uh, Perry mentioned the reduction in sprinklers from 20,000 square foot to 12,000 square foot in schools as far as the threshold is concerned. Um, all the schools, all the public schools here in town are already sprinklered, so we didn't feel that that was a major issue. On, on page 9, you will also see modifications that the codes update from an engineering standpoint. Um, standards are updated with regard to um, uh, engineering design for wind loads. The most recent American Concrete Institute Standard 318 <coughs> is, is, is adopted and put into this code. Same with masonry structures and wood structures, so that's another criteria. What you'll also see on this is the next portion that deals with what we did here locally that was not in the codes from before. Um, you mentioned the, the hold, hold open. Okay. Um, 715-48, door closing devices. Uh, the fire department um, makes inspections of existing um, both apartments, hotels, motels. And one of the issues that Perry kept coming to us on was that the doors, especially the doors that are serving the vertical stair enclosures, are chucked open. That, it, that is the last defense as far as getting out in case of a fire um, to at least protect the vertical stair enclosures. And what was proposed here is this is only a new construction, not retroactively, but to, to require that where you have a vertical stair enclosure to have an automatic opening, uh, automatic closing device that's tied in the fire alarm. So that door can remain open as much as any building owner or any tenant would want, but it'll close when it's required to be closed, and that's when the fire alarm goes off to protect that exit way. That was brought in front of the Multi-Housing Association, and uh, they really had no problem with that. Um, fire area, Perry talked about where we made a change to the um, national model code, which would have required 
would have expanded fire areas if you put a canopy on the outside of the building. Wherever you expand fire areas, you could get into sprinkling an existing building. We got rid of that. We're just maintaining the status quo for that. 90328 is the provision that um, we met with the Land Use Committee at least, it seems like about four or five months ago. Well, it's been a while. Um, 90328 remains exactly in the code as the way it was, and that is the, the building code has required sprinklers in multifamily occupancies since the 2000 adoption of the building code. So we went through 2000, 2003, 2006, um, having a, a, a provision that only requires sprinklers in multifamily where it's three levels or more or more than 16 units as compared to what the building code says is if it's a multifamily, you sprinkle it. Um, that was left in, um, so the status quo is being maintained for that. The last page is dealing with apartments, um, what's called type A dwelling units. Uh, one of the things that I try to do before it gets to first and second reading is to have as many meetings as possible with everybody that's concerned that's going to be affected by this. And quite frankly, I thought that um, I hadn't heard from the multi-housing people for at least three months thinking that there was no issue, and I got a call from them last Friday. And we ended up having a meeting today concerning type A, dwell type a dwelling units. Um, what federal guidelines require for accessibility or adaptability in apartments is what's called type B dwelling units, and the codes through our ANSI standards match up federal guidelines very, very closely. Um, but the codes have went above and beyond that since federal fair housing <coughs> got put in to require type A dwelling units, which is more, not a completely accessible unit, but provides for a design that calls for more accessibility within that unit for, for anybody with a, in, with a disability to be able to utilize that apartment unit. Uh, the multi-housing people had an issue with this today, um, and, and that was dealing with issues of, of affordability and issues of, of them, them saying that uh, sometimes these are hard to, hard to rent out. So hopefully what came out of this meeting today is to have another meeting probably af after the first reading to hopefully get a resolution of this so, so that um, either, either we'll stay with what we've had to eliminate type A dwelling units, either we'll leave um, what, what is being proposed to you right now is to mandate type A dwelling units, but we also heard the possibility of a compromise to require type A dwelling units at 1% instead of 2% of the amount of units. I should explain that. Type A dwelling units are required after the first 20 units in either a building or a site, and then after that it's 2% have to be more accessible than a type B. So um, that one is kind of caught me off guard, and hopefully we'll have a resolution for that, obviously, before second reading. Mr. Chair. So let's, uh, could I uh, request that Todd Anowski from Home Builders come forward? <clears throat> Thanks for coming down today, Todd. It's uh, good to see you. Say, Todd, uh, you know, I, I'm aware that the Home Builders Association spends a lot of time with the city of Sioux Falls, uh, puts their credibility on the line studying these code issues. Uh, and, and I'd like this council to know that the, these guys volunteer and spend a lot of time and there's a lot of give and take between the city and the Home Builders Association. And, and like I say, the Home Builders Association puts their credibility on the line so Ron can come down here and say the Home Builders Association or, you know, approve this here and it gives us a little, uh, you know, sense that it, these have been looked at by somebody. And, and Todd, my, the thing that I would like to propose to you and ask that the Home Builders Association is, is Ron was, was taken back and surprised by, you know, a number of people who were seemingly unaware of the changes that were going on, and, and I was surprised that Ron was surprised, I guess. And, and what I would hope is that the Home Builders Association could reach out, because uh, certainly there are builders that have multifamily that also develop land and do single family that should be on, that should be aware of these code things. Why can't they reach out and talk to these other multifamily, uh, you know, and apartment owners and, and, and get them involved in the dialogue here. I mean, uh, this is a couple of times that we've experienced this type of uh, surprise that's registered on an issue like this, and I, it's totally unnecessary. Do you, would, you, would you put that forward at one of your board meetings? Or? 
Certainly, we can uh, we can bring that up and <clears throat> explore that. Uh, our meetings with with Ron pretty much centered on the IRC, the International Residential Code. And granted, we do have some members that are home builders, and we also have some members that are, you know, multifamily uh, builders too. So, going forward, yeah, we'd we'd certainly entertain that to, to get our uh, folks from that group and, and discuss the issue further. Thanks, Todd. I think it'd make it a lot easier on uh, you know for Ron and, and us down here at the council if everybody was on the same page and we didn't have these last-minute uh, run-ups. And I'm not saying the home builder is responsible for it, but I'd ask that you reach out and certainly see if we do that. Thank you, Todd. Council Staggers? Yeah, I guess in, in terms of reaching out, I guess I'm, I'm glad that uh, Ron and Perry came here today to talk to the, the complete council about these various code changes. But also at the same time, I'm wondering why we didn't have this go to committee too, so that we could have further opportunity for people to come and speak about, uh, you know, pro and con about this. Um, we're simply proposing to adopt, uh, to bring this to the council for your, your, your review. Uh, there is an extraordinary amount of criteria in these codes, and I just don't know how much that the council wants to go through every code item that's in here. So we're hoping that by convincing to the council that we have met with those people that are affected by the codes and have got their inputs and have put in local amendments, that that would be sufficient enough information for the council to adopt the codes. I guess what I'm thinking of is, for example, not everybody belongs to the multi-housing association. And maybe there are some people that, uh, you know, who have property that don't belong to that association would, would like to come and speak before a council committee. I don't. I don't control going to the committee. So, yeah. No, I'm just. I'm just wondering if. Uh, uh, I mean, this is this is not just with this particular issue, but also on other issues too. About you know, sometimes the committees are not being utilized, and this is really important too. I mean, uh, super important uh, ordinance dealing with these various codes. I, I'm just curious, uh, Councilor Stagg, uh, Ron. We do these how often? Three years. Every, Every three, three years. years. And Council Staggers, you've been on the council long, and I have. Have they previously gone through committees? Well, that's the concern. They haven't. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, we like to just maybe do things the way that we've done in the past, but maybe we should also start thinking about utilizing the committee system a lot more than we have. Because right now, you know, it's just haphazard. You know, some things go to committee, others do not. And so it would really be good uh, to come up with more of a, a formula as to what goes through the committee and what doesn't. And this year is so important. Uh, I know it just seems to me that it would have been good to go through committee. Maybe we'll assign that to a committee to figure out what items are going to go to committees. Well, let me make one statement. I, I don't agree that, it, that this is haphazard. I mean, we have met with, as far as the building code is concerned, uh, we've had an all-day seminar. We brought in people from ICC with the architects that went over every one of these code changes. Uh, the AIA convention was in the fall. I talked to all the architects about, again, what the major changes are within the code requirements. I met with the mayor's disability community, uh, committee, um, engineers, and this is ultimately went through our Board of Appeals for, for a review of all these code changes and local amendments. Yeah. When I say haphazard, I'm not talking about your process, but I mean the city councils. So, I mean, I'm glad you went through all of those different uh, groups. Uh, I wish we would have had maybe this going through uh, one of the city council's committees, too. Any other questions for Ron? I do have one. Council Ron? Probably not related to these changes, Ron, but the, when I talk to existing uh, landlords of existing property, when they want to do maybe minor upgrades to electrical or things like that, they, they end up switching out the entire electrical system. Are there ways that, that could be phased in that would make some of the most affordable housing in Sioux Falls um, improvements phased in instead of the costly expense of having to completely redo the electrical? And uh, in many cases, then they don't do it, and the tenants are in more jeopardy, I would say. Is there something I'm missing on that? I think so. Okay, fill um, me in. 
Uh, what, what the codes require is that any new re renovation remodel, that work itself has to meet code. I think there's a, a misunderstanding out there with the codes that <coughs> if somebody wants to renovate or remodel, that that throws in all of the new construction standards into that. That's not the case at all. And as a matter of fact, the third code down here is the existing building code, which, um, which is a, an alternate that a designer or a contractor or an architect can utilize that really lessens the, the requirements that you do in an existing building to otherwise have to comply with even the provisions of the building code for that type of remodel. The only thing that I can think of is in a single family dwelling that if you replace the service, let's say you have a, a 40 amp or 60 amp service and you choose to go to 100 amp, there, there used to be a provision where you had to do some significant uh, renovations of that wiring inside the house and we got rid of that when we adopted the building code that only required certain things that you could get to like GFI protection in the bathrooms. Um, the, uh, I'm, there used to be a requirement for putting in um, outlets um, 12 foot around the room, which we got rid of. So really, it's, it's a misunderstanding that people that do renovations, they don't have to bring everything up to code. Typically, it's only the work that they do has to comply. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Ron? Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I, I got some more. Oh, you do? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be fast and brief. Um, we've we got a series of other codes, and that's the International Residential Code, uh, which is a home builder's code. I, I think Todd and, and Bob was talking about the process that we go through. We've met with the Home Builders Association for five or six months and went through all of the changes. And I think we got a very good um, working ordinance that deals with, with the changes that are in the code, dealing with portability. A huge huge change that happened with the IRC was the mandate of requiring sprinklers in one and two family dwellings and town townhomes. Uh, we chose that we are not going to require that. As a matter of fact, there's pending state law that will take away the, the municipalities and counties' ability to do that, which is unfortunate. But because we had we have the ability to make that determination at the local level, but that's just my point of view, I guess. Um, the next one is the International Existing Building Code, which is what we were talking about with, with, the, with an alternate. Um, there's basically with that, we've, we've carried over most of the ordinances from the 2006. There was only one minor change that we had to do in that, and that was to make sure that our egress windows that, that were referenced in that was at the reduced area of egress windows that we have for local amendment. The next one is the International Mechanical Code and the International Fuel Gas Code, which is the, the code for heating, ventilation, air conditioning contractors. I can tell you this, that the, um, this was handled through our Mechanical Board of Appeals for, again, a period of five months. Our mechanical staff went through every item, practically, that, that was a change, sought their input, and we ended up not having a whole lot of, of major changes on that, but you'll, you'll see what's changing the code and what the local ordinances are. The last one is the International Property Maintenance Code, which is our housing code. This deals with the existing structures and maintaining just the minimums of minimum standards, um, dealing, dealing with life safety within existing um, primarily residential occupancies, but it goes into commercial also. One of the changes that we did in, in that, as far as a new change, is a provision where we do a notice of demolition. Um, the National Model Code requires a 24-month waiting period after the notice and order for us to proceed with a demolition criteria if that is the only option that's left out there. Uh, we've had input um, that, that two years tends to be a long time period, and we're proposing to change that down to 18 months instead of a 24, instead of two years, so a year and a half. With that, any questions? <coughs> no questions? Any other good news for us? Excuse me? Any other good news for us? That's enough. None? Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any other uh, council open discussion? We had uh, planned to do an executive session, but we decided to uh, 
put that off till next week. So next week, plan on having an executive session for a personnel matter. If there's nothing else, we are adjourned. <laughs>